All righty, well, right. good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to present our speaker for today, Tony G. Girolamo. He is a New Jersey screenwriter, novelist, comic book writer, game designer, comedian, and actor. Uh, he is best known for his work on The Simpsons and Bart Simpson comic books. He has also been a joke writer for Politically Incorrect with Bill Mayer and script writer for Space Ghost Coast to Coast, as well as a blogger for Comedy Central's Indecision website. He has written screenplays, including Mafioso, The Father, The Son, starring Leo Rosie. His novels, Fix in Overtime and The Undercover Dragon, are available through Padwolf Publishing. And after publishing his own comics books, the Jersey Devil, The Travelers, and The Fix with SJRP, he eventually got a publishing deal with Kenzer and Company. Kenzer published The Travelers. Tony also wrote Evernights, as well as Haclopedia of Beasts, Volume 1 through 8, and Slaughterhouse Indigo. Or Indigo, sorry. He wrote a graphic novel adaptation of Personal Reflections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain. He has also contributed a story to Outlaw Territory, Volume 3, from Image Comics, and is a proud author of the Pineys series. So welcome, Tony. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank um, you, Andrew. It's quite a long introduction, but you have many, uh, many accolades to your, to your name. So um, again, thank you so much. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, we just have a few housekeeping items to go through. Uh, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions throughout the program today, so please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard, and we'll be kind of addressing them um, as they come in. Um, there will be a survey available at the end of the, the webinar, so if you do have time, we ask that you please complete the survey. We always appreciate any feedback that you can give us. And if you want more information on Tony and his work, there is a web address on the screen there. I'll be making sure that gets sent out in the chat once we get underway so that you have a live link to it. And you can check out a whole bunch of uh, things related to, to Tony, his work. Um, it's really a, fa a fantastic site. And lastly, one thing I want to do is just go over the Zoom dashboard for those of you who might not be familiar. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see your audio settings. This is where you can check to make sure that your headset or earbuds are connected properly. At any point during the presentation, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that. That'll alert me, and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve any problems that you're having. And lastly, as I said, if you do have any questions or feel like you want to contribute to the conversation that's going on, there is the chat and the Q&A buttons here. Feel free to use either of those and we'll address your questions um, as they come in. So, Tony, that is everything that I have. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And thanks for having me here at the New Jersey State Library. And uh, that's little Joan in the background. For those of you, you may see her pop up every once in a while. Uh, guys, my name is Tony DiGirolamo, and I write The Pineys. It's about a family of hunters that hunt the kin of the Jersey Devil. But before I get into what my books are really about, I want to tell you all about the Jersey Devil legend. Uh, for those of you who don't know the basic legend, it goes something like this. In the 1730s, there was a woman named Leeds, Mother Leeds, who lived on uh, Moss Mill Road, perhaps, in Leeds Point, New Jersey, and she was the 13th child of her family. She had 13 children. And on a windswept night in the pines, she was giving birth and she cried out, uh, curse this child, let the devil take it. And thus was born the Jersey Devil, a horrible monster that ate the family, flew out the chimney, and has been haunting the Pine Barrens ever since. And that's kind of the basic story. And then there's many, many variations on it. Uh, some you can read in the original book the Jersey Devil by McCloy and Miller. Sometimes it's not the 13th child, it's the sixth of the sixth of the sixth or the seventh of the seventh. Uh, sometimes it's not Mother Leeds or Mrs. Leeds. Sometimes it's Mrs. Shords, or sometimes it's Jane Johnson Leeds of Mullica River. 
Sometimes it's not Leeds Point. Sometimes it's Dorothy, New Jersey, Esteville, Pleasantville, Burlington. Uh, there's even a, an alternate address in the Jersey Devil book. Uh, Columbus, New Jersey at the Columbus Inn, if you're familiar with that historical building. Uh, sometimes the Jersey Devil story is completely different. Um, there is a version of the story where a colonial woman has an affair with a British soldier during the Revolutionary War, and thus the Jersey Devil is born. There's another version of a gypsy curse. There's a version uh, in which a man in the 1850s in Vienna, New Jersey, would dress up as a devil every day, uh, not every day, but every year, and uh, uh, have a Halloween party and tell, tell a story about the Jersey Devil. And that uh, propagated the legend, they say. Um, there's all sorts of different permutations on the devil, where it lives, what it looks like, and uh, how did this all happen? What, 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 what craziness uh, came out of South Jersey like this? Well, it's uh, a bit complicated. I met, um, I believe it was Miller, uh, years ago, and he told me some of the historical stuff that they researched and uh, that could lend itself to the legend. But what you really have to understand is the time period in the 1730s in New Jersey. In the 1730s, we weren't a state. Uh, New Jersey was the province, and it was the province of East and West Jersey uh, uh, in England uh, later. First it was Swede, and then it was Dutch, and then it was English. Um, so the line, uh, that split East and West New Jersey kind of went diagonally down the state above Trenton and uh, sort of headed south a little bit. Um, everything above the line was East Jersey. Everything below the line was West Jersey. And the easy way to remember that is above the line, Taylor ham, below the line, pork roll. For those of you in South Jersey, you'll get that joke. Um, and even back then, there was no central Jersey. So tell your relatives at West Windsor, there is no central Jersey. There's only north and south. Anyhow, um, the uh, province of West Jersey, the representative of the king was uh, Daniel Leeds, the patriarch of the Leeds family. So in order to have a business, in order to uh, farm or whatever you had to get permission from the king the king couldn't give everybody permission individually so he would have representatives Leeds was the representative in west jersey so people naturally resented the Leeds family because they were rich and powerful and, and they could sort of make or break you right if you got a plot of land in the pine barrens and uh you say hey i'm going to be a farmer i'm going to grow a bunch of stuff and then you got there and you could only grow pine cones you might re resent the guy who gave you that plot of land. It was the 1730s, so things were just a little different. Um, maybe you get a rumors about the Leeds family and whisper down the lane, you get the Jersey Devil. But the historical stuff probably added to it. So what McCloy and Miller found was there was a branch of the Leeds family, Deborah and Jaffet Leeds. They lived on Moss Mill Road uh, right across from Smithville, if you know where Smithville is, in Leeds Point, and they had a house. And if you go online, you could probably find a picture of the house when it was still standing. They say it's their house. And uh, they found their family Bible. And uh, they told me inside the family Bible, which was the way to you know do genealogy back then, you would put all your family uh, names in it, all your children. They had a listing of 12 names for their children and a 13th space that was blank. So what was this blank 13th space? Well, it could have been they never had a child they intended to. Uh, it's the 1730s. The child could have died in childbirth, very common. Their theory is they did have a 13th child, but it was born severely handicapped. Now in the 1730s, what would they have said? They would have said, this child is touched by the devil. Uh, and perhaps this was very upsetting to the Leeds family. Maybe they decided not to bring the child outside. They never got it baptized. They'd be afraid to write it in the Bible. Um, and they would keep it in the house. But the Leeds family had servants. They had money and wealth. 
the servants would have seen the child, they would have talked, because this is the 1730s, what else do you have to do? And whisper down the lane, maybe you get the Jersey Devil. But there is a third factor, and uh, a third factor, uh, a founding father uh, helped spread the legend of the Jersey Devil. Can anybody out in the audience out there, uh, if you want to say in chat, or uh, I don't know, I'm a boomer for this stuff. If you want to say in chat, I think I can say it. Uh, which founding father may have contributed to the legend of the Jersey Devil? I'll just give you a minute while I sip. Mm. Any guesses? Any guesses? Oh, someone guessed. AD guessed correctly. Ben Franklin. That, that's Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, Ben Franklin um, helped spread the legend of the Jersey Devil, and this is why. This is the 1730s, so Ben Franklin is a young printer in Philadelphia, and he's got a brand new book, and it's called Poor Richard's Almanac. Uh, the problem for him is he has a competitor that already has the market cornered on almanacs, and that is the Leeds family. They have the Leeds family almanac. And it is published at this time by Titan Leeds, the son of Daniel. Daniel had passed by this time. So Titan is publishing his book, and uh, Ben Franklin is relentlessly smearing the Leeds family. Part of the reason he was doing this is the Leeds family had a falling out with the Quakers at the time. And if you know anything about the era, uh, the Quakers were big players in the colonial uh, colonial America, pre-colonial, I guess you would call it. Um, so to have a falling out with the Quakers, eh, you could you could uh, run into some problems. And uh, so uh, Franklin was kind of piling on and taking advantage of that uh, in order to say, you know, you can buy the Leeds family almanac. I hear it's uh, full of a bunch of witchcraft. In fact, I think they have astrology there. That sounds awfully like witchcraft to me. It would also point out that the logo for the uh, Leeds family crest, what which was a little dragon, looks suspiciously like something demonic. Um, and uh, so he would point these things out and uh, try to get people to buy his wholesome almanac. Uh, he, would, he even went so far as to predict the death of Titan Leeds. And when Titan didn't die on the date Franklin said, uh, they said, Franklin, he's not dead. And uh, Ben Franklin said, oh, no, he's dead. Uh, see, his ghost is continuing to publish the almanac. Um, so he went to these extreme lengths. And you could see in the 1730s where people would congregate in taverns and a big loud mouth like me would get up in front of them and tell all sorts of crazy stories because why not? You have nothing to do but drink. And... Um, these rumors would just keep going and going and going. So you've got Ben Franklin, you've got just generally people being bored, the times and uh, possibly the natural resentment people would have had of the Leeds family whisper down the lane, you get the Jersey Devil legend. But they didn't call it the Jersey Devil in the 1730s, they called it the Leeds Devil. And for about 150 to 170 years, that's what it was known as. People would whisper and say, oh, the Leeds Devil. Watch out for the Leeds Devil. But then everything changed. In 1909, there was a man named Norman Jeffries, and Norman ran the Ninth and Arch Street Museum in Philadelphia. Uh, and this was sort of a freak show for uh, businessmen. You, you would see uh, 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 bearded ladies, uh, boa constrictors, women playing basketball. It was 1909. Uh, you would get your uh, your lager, your mutton chops, your cigar, your bowler hat, and you'd go down to the uh, Ninth and Arch Street Museum, and for a dime, you would see all this wacky stuff. But the uh, museum was falling on hard times, and Norman needed a new act. So he's in a bookstore in Market Street, and he comes across the story of the Leeds Devil, and he says, yes, this. He grabs one of his carnies, and he writes a letter, and he says, here, take this letter, to South Jersey and mail it to the newspapers. So the Carney does that. And what the letter said, which Norman wrote, was, I'm a New Jersey housewife and my husband went to the barn and he was accosted by the Jers uh, the Leeds devil. Oh, it's terrible. And so the newspaper people get this. And uh, now what you have to understand at the time, 
the people who in 1909, it was very rare that people went to college and these were the elites, right? They looked down upon the people of South Jersey. They were all agrarian farmers. Oh, those, those poor rubes, uh, those poor uh, hillbillies, they're probably in a jug band, uh, marrying their sisters. Uh, <clears throat> they also called them pineys. And that's where the term comes from, pineys. Um, it was a derogatory term, meaning you were a bunch of hillbilly rubes uh, that wore overalls and played the jug band. So they didn't publish this letter because they liked people in South Jersey. They published it to laugh at them. <clears throat> so they published the letter and instantly it goes viral for 1909. And so um, uh, going viral in 1909 meant you sold a lot of newspapers. And so people start buying, buying the newspapers, reading about this Leeds devil. What is this Leeds devil? There's a monster in South Jersey. I had no idea. So people start reading it and they start selling papers like crazy. So the other newspapers see it and say, they say, oh, we got to do a story about the Leeds devil too. And then of course, reporters being reporters, as they report things over and over again, they have to change up the names to make it sound more dynamic. So uh, different newspapers called it different things. They called it the Leeds Devil, but also the Jersey, what is it? They called it the Jersey Jabberwock. And eventually the Trenton Tribune in 1909 coined the phrase, the Jersey Devil. There's a blog, uh, it's called the Rick Grass blog. He has a lot of great headlines. And he he determined that in 1909, that was probably the first time they used the term Jersey Devil. So people start seeing it everywhere. And uh, the newspapers also asked scientists, uh, what do you think the Jersey Devil is? And some scientists would get up in an interview and said, well, I'm very important. I uh, will tell you what a, a science would say. Science would say that the Jersey Devil is a pterodactyl that has been frozen in ice for millions of years. And now it is thawed out and is attacking these poor pineys. That is the Jersey Devil. No, 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 said another scientist. That is foolish. Uh, what the Jersey Devil is, is a giant typhoid germ that has flown here from Mars. And that is the Jersey Devil, my friend. That is science. See, even back then, you can't even trust the scientists. Anyhow, um, people started reading this. People started seeing it everywhere. Uh, there were a couple of guys in Gibbstown. Uh, they were in a newspaper article and said, oh, the Jersey Devil hopped up on the roof of our shed and then flew away. A group of uh, people uh, on a trolley in Camden, New Jersey, claimed to have seen it on the tracks and it got spooked and it flew up into the wires and exploded. It was probably a whooping crane, but everybody was spooked about the Jersey Devil. Then there was a police captain in Camden, New Jersey, claimed to have shot at it. People were seeing it everywhere. And uh, what contributed to the hysteria was this was 1909 in January, so there was lots of snow on the ground. If you can remember a January with snow, back then they had it. So um, there was a guy who was robbing houses at the time, and what he would do is he would take horseshoes and he nailed them to boards and then tied them to his feet. So when he walked around your property, he didn't leave footprints. He only left horseshoe tracks, which at that time, 1909, nobody would look at horseshoe tracks twice except everybody was wound up about the Jersey Devil. So when he cased your house, people would notice the tracks and say, hey, wait a minute, this is a two-footed cloven creature. Oh my God, the Jersey Devil's been at my house looking in the windows. And so this added to the hysteria. If you were a businessman in 1909, you might go out drinking and carousing with your buddies get into fights, get into all sorts of trouble and come home all disheveled. Your wife would be very angry and cross. And uh, so perhaps one of these businessmen came home one night all disheveled. And uh, as his wife got angry and said, how you went out drinking and carousing, didn't you? And the businessman would say, no, 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 honey. I was coming out of church. I was accosted by the Jersey devil and I will swear to it on a stack of Bibles. Get the cops. I'll fill out a report. Better than being in trouble with you. Uh, so this kind of stuff just kept snowballing uh, all during January of 1909. But eventually, Norman started to get worried because uh, there was so much attention paid to his hoax, he thought he might go to jail. 
uh, but he decided to reel it all in. So he needed to stage a capture of the Jersey Devil. And uh, so he decided to do, do that. And naturally, he rented a kangaroo. So he took the kangaroo and he painted it green. Uh, the kangaroo licked off all the paint and nearly died. Then he tied wings to its back, antlers to its head, and set it loose in Fairmount Park. Got a bunch of the carnies and captured the Jersey Devil. And if you go back into the archives, and, and if anybody can find this damn picture, I've been looking for it for ages now. I saw it once and I wish I had saved it. Um, but it's a picture of Norman and the carnies standing around a tree with the poor kangaroo tied to it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they say we've captured the Jersey Devil. Brave hunters capture the Jersey Devil. And in the same newspapers that ginned up all this hysteria, they advertised the Jersey Devil would be appearing live at the 9th and Arch Street Museum. Now that ad for the Jersey Devil had an illustration and it looked like a little dragon. Now, at that time, there were a few illustrations, but the illustration for the live event became kind of the prototype for the look of the Jersey Devil. And that one is usually the one that's repeated again and again and again. If there is a, uh, there's an old timey wanted poster, wanted dead or alive, a lot of times they use that illustration. Um, so as it's evolved, the look of the Jersey Devil has evolved as people have seen it. That's the look uh, they have. And now, of course, in the modern day, we have everything named after the Jersey Devil in South Jersey. There's Jersey Devil Jeep. Uh, Jersey Devil Chocolate, Jersey Devil Mini Golf, Jersey Devil Roller Coaster, the Jersey Devil Hockey Team, uh, Jersey Devil Chili, Jersey Devil uh, Wine, Jersey Devil Tattoo, Jersey Devil Beer, uh, Jersey Devil Marina, and I'm probably forgetting a bunch of others. But everything in South Jersey <laughs> eventually gets named after the Jersey Devil for that very reason. Uh, it is New Jersey's official state demon. So you can go on the government's website and you can actually see that we have an official state demon. Uh, we're the only state to have our own demon. So kudos to New Jersey. And um, uh, this has permeated uh, the consciousness of people of South Jersey for many decades. Uh, people have seen it over and over again. In the 1950s, there was a big um, sighting uh, that people went to the Pine Barrens to hunt it, and um, a circus had offered a $100,000 reward, dead or alive, for the capture of the Jersey Devil. It got so bad, the local police departments had to put up signs that said, the Jersey Devil is a hoax. They were trying to keep people from uh, camping in the pines because too many people eventually starts a fire. This is the 1950s where, you know, people were safer, you know, knew more about camping, I would think, but you know, there was always a danger in the summer, you'd start yourself a, a good Pine Barrens fire. Um, there have been sightings. If you go to Google and type in the Jersey Devil, um, you will see the sightings pop up. A lot of them are from 1909, but some of them are for later years. One of the sightings that is attributed to the Jersey Devil is in 1980, there was a bunch of guys on ATVs and they came across these uh, bodies of pigs and the pigs had been killed and it looked like something with claws landed on their back and ate out their brains, but just left the rest of the body. The brains were gone, the pigs were dead, and uh, nobody knows. But they say, well, no, that was the Jersey Devil. And over the years, I've met dozens of people who have seen it and described it in different, crazy different ways. And, um, you know, if you, if you go down in the pines and you hear, hear strange noises, you may just be hearing the Jersey Devil. Um, one of the uh, more recent uh, theories uh, includes the hammerhead bat, and it's this giant bat. It's got about a six foot wingspan, has a huge head. It looks like a kind of like a horse. And um, when you look at it, you could say, oh, yeah, this you could see people looking at this giant bat and saying, well, this might be a, a reason people said that it's the Jersey Devil. The bat uh, while it's possible somebody brought one here, it's only native to Africa, it probably wouldn't survive a winter here. So it seems unlikely. The most recent appearance um, 
I believe was in 2015, I think. Uh, and that was at the Pomona golf course. There's video to it online. If you want to check it out, it's pretty good. Uh, so a guy got captured it and you could see it flying around. It kind of looks like a llama with wings and horns. Um, but South Jersey isn't just about the Jersey devil in terms of folklore. There's tons of stuff around the Jersey devil, uh, in terms of folklore. One of the, uh, stories is the woman in white. And we have about three different women in white in South Jersey. And it's a very common tale in folklore. So the first woman in white is at the Flanders Hotel in Ocean City. Her name is Emily, and it's what they named their restaurant after. Another version is the woman in white on Route 55. There's a video online. Route 55 is also known as Indian Curse Road. And um, it's cursed because they built an Indian burial mound there was an Indian burial mound there and they built a uh, uh, off ramp there to the mall back in the mid 80s when malls were still a thing. Um, book eight of the Pineys is about Route 55. Stay off of 55. There's been a lot of accidents. Uh, check out the video if you get a chance. And the third woman in white is on the beach somewhere in South Jersey. She looks out over the ocean for her lost love. And they say she pals around with the Jersey Devil sometimes on the beach. Also on the beach, uh, the Headless Ghost Pirate. The Headless Ghost Pirate story is that Captain Kidd, uh, the famous pirate, buried his treasure in South Jersey and beheaded one of his own men so the ghost would guard the treasure. And so he was a character in the Jersey Devil comic book that I wrote back in the 90s. And uh, he is supposedly pals around with the Jersey Devil. And the fourth uh, pal of the Jersey Devil is the Black Dog. The legend of the Black Dog is another common one in folk tales in different cultures. It's usually a negative uh, connotation, but in South Jersey, it's a positive. So if you see the ghost of the Black Dog, the Black Dog is trying to help you, trying to warn you of something, uh, trying to say, oh, stay out of that water or whatever. And uh, they say he was the, uh, the dog that belonged to the cabin boy on on Captain Kidd's ship and died. And now he now he travels South Jersey with the Jersey Devil, the Woman in White, and the Headless Ghost Pirate. Um, there's also witches, uh, which are pretty common in uh, Jersey folk tales. One of the books <clears throat> you can read is uh, Legends, Lores, Pine Barrens, Legends, Lores, and Lies by William McMahon. It's got a lot of the great uh, folk tales from South Jersey, other than the Jersey Devil. Uh, my favorite is the story of Peggy Clevenger. She was a witch and she lived in the town of Pasadena. Pasadena was located probably, excuse me, near the Terracotta factory ruins down in the Pine Barrens. This is near Weymouth Furnace, if you've ever been down that way. And um, she was a witch. She could turn into a, a rabbit. She could turn into a lizard. Uh, she could do all sorts of witchy things and uh, it was very, very playful or whatever. Um, but she had an abusive husband named Bill. And Bill Clevenger said to her one day, Peggy, when I get to hell, I'll let you know how hot hell is. And then uh, one day, Peggy had enough of his abuse and nailed them shut inside their house and burned it to the ground. And the next day, the well in Pasadena boiled. And this was Bill telling her how hot hell was. And they say, if you're in the pines and you find the boiling well, you're standing in the ruins of Pasadena. But beware, they also say that the inhabitants of Pasadena stayed there and interbred over and over again. And now there are a bunch of crazy albinos that live in the pines. And if they find you, they will capture you and make them make you part of their kin. So beware on that. Um, so lots of great stories in the Pine Barrens. And uh, uh, there's uh, also different ghost towns and crazy towns. One of my favorite towns, uh, which I write about in the most recent book of the Pineys, it's called uh, The Piney and the Ghost Chasers of Ong's Hat. Ong's Hat is a legendary town in the Pines. Uh, it was founded by Jacob Ong. And the story goes, him and the settlers got into the Pines and they said, Jacob, where are we going to build our town? And he took off his hat and threw it in a tree and went there. And they built the town around the tree. And thus, Ong's hat 
was born. Um, however, the town kind of disappeared. They say the last known inhabitant in Ong's hat uh, disappeared either in the 1930s or the 1970s. Nobody's really sure. The town no longer no longer exists. Um, it is it was located where the beginning of the Batona Trail starts, which is a hiking trail in South Jersey. And uh, there's a parking lot there. It's called Ong's Hat Parking Lot. That's where the village was. I know this because you can go on a site called historicaerials.com, which takes Google Maps and uh, puts them on top of each other by year. And then after that uses aerial maps and that goes back quite a ways. So there's an aerial map, I believe it's from like 1931. And uh, you can look on the black and white aerial map uh, for the town of, or for the area of Pemberton, New Jersey. And you can see on the map, the words Ong's Hat, you can see the tiny little uh, buildings there. So the village was still in operation, at least when they took that picture. Um, there's also a rumor on the internet that says, uh, inter interdimensional travelers visit Ong's Hat and they've done experiments of inter on interdimensional travel in Ong's Hat, which may uh, explain why people keep appearing and disappearing or weird stuff just happens in Ong's Hat. Uh, another great town that I love to talk about also in book 12 is Ancora, New Jersey. And most of you South Jersey residents will know that name because Ancora is where the psychiatric facility is built. Um, Ancora originally was settled in 1860 by Dr. George Haskell and his uh, followers who were known as spiritualists. And they were basically, and I swear this is true, psychic communists. So they believed in speaking to the dead with their uh, various spiritual powers, but they also built the village and the idea was to share in all the resources uh, so somehow that would all work out. Communism doesn't work, so the place failed after Haskell died in 1870. Um, so, uh, but they had a town there. Uh, it was a real town. And uh, then they built the uh, tuberculosis sanatorium. It was called Sunny Rest. And up until a few years ago, I can't find it now, but there used to be an entrance to Sunny Rest still just off the roadway near Ancora Hospital. And it looked cool as hell. I wish I'd taken a picture of it. It was this wrought iron thing. It said Sunny Rest on the top uh, in wrought iron. And there was all vines growing over it. And it looked cool. It, it was something out of a movie. Um, then they built a prison farm. And then after that, in 1955, they built the massive complex that's there today called the Ancora State Psychiatric Hospital. And it was huge. It had uh, housing for the staff. It had a post office. It had a uh, fire station. It had a police station. It had underground tunnels. Because I know when I think of mental health, I think underground tunnels. Uh, no, I, I hear they're actually very nice and they're for the staff to go to and from different buildings. Anyhow, they also built the Veterans Rest. And then there's a story that the veterans uh, will come out of the, uh, of the Veterans Rest at night and fight to the death in gladiatorial games in the Pine Barrens. I don't know how true it is. I, I think that would be illegal. Anyhow, um, the weird thing about that is um, I also make comics and I've been involved in comic books for many years. DC Comics, for those of you who don't know, publishes Batman. And they also publish the DC Atlas, which explains where all their fictional characters live and where the cities are. Uh, Batman lives in Gotham City. Gotham City, according to the DC Atlas, is located in South Jersey. It's the sister city of Atlantic City. Additionally, Gotham has Arkham Asylum, which sounds an awful lot like Ancora. And Arkham Asylum, where, where the Joker lives, has the same sort of, excuse me, uh, occult background, weird history that um, Ancora does. So I think maybe somebody from DC may have read the history of South Jersey. I don't know. It just, just is a feeling I have. Um, but this is the craziness of South Jersey and all the history and uh, ghost stories 
there's also a ton of pirate treasure. I've been reading uh, uh, this book here, The Pirates of New Jersey. There's a crazy amount of pirates and pirate treasure here. Um, I uh, went to a uh, event. I did I, I did a speaking engagement at Vinyl Brewery in Hamilton, and I was talking about the various pirates and highway bandits that lived in South Jersey. And there was a pair named Fagan and Fenton, and they uh, operated out of Farmingdale, New Jersey, and during the Revolutionary War. The bartender at Vinyl was like, "Oh, my last name is Fenton." And I said, oh, that's so weird. Well, this was Jacob Fenton. He said, my brother's name is Jacob. And uh, in fact, he said his grandfather had told him stories about highwaymen. Uh, so he may be uh, a Fenton descendant. Fenton uh, apparently claimed before he died that they had a bunch of treasure somewhere in their hideout, uh, secret hideout in Farmingdale, New Jersey because he tried to bargain with his life when they caught him for being a highway bandit. Uh, they did not take the bribe, so Fenton tried to escape and they shot him dead. Uh, there's another story of highway bandits during that time, Joe and the refugees, Joe Mulliner. I uh, wrote about it in issues five and six of the Jersey Devil comic. Joe and the refugees would rob towns uh, during the Revolutionary War. All the men were up north fighting the war. So the towns were kind of defenseless. They would come into a town during a dance and uh, Joe's men would hold everybody hostage. He'd dance with the ladies and then they'd rob everybody and leave. And so he never hurt anybody. He was considered the gentleman robber. But the complete opposite, which I write about in book six of the Pineys, is Bloody John Bacon. Bloody John Bacon committed the Long Beach Island Massacre in 1782. Uh, him and his men came across some American sailors who were camped out on a beach. They were going to recover some scuttled ships. And while they were asleep, they just started killing them. They killed about 18 sailors before anybody woke up and drove them off. And uh, it was considered almost a war crime at the time. It was outrageous. These guys killed people while they were asleep. So they hunted uh, Bacon down like a dog. They eventually caught up to him at the Cedar Bridge Tavern in the Pine Barrens, and they fought the last official battle of the American Revolution. And this is reenacted every year in December down at the Cedar Bridge Tavern. But he got away. He went back up to LBI and shortly after the war, Captain John Stewart tracked him back there before he could steal another boat. Uh, Bacon went for his musket and Stewart stabbed him through the heart. Uh, dead, uh, they dragged his body through the street and the angry townspeople were gonna bury him in the middle of the road so he wouldn't have a Christian funeral. But his brother begged the crowd, please, let me have my brother's body, give him a proper funeral. He was a loyalist like you. And the crowd relented and gave him the body. Uh, Bacon is buried in Arneytown Cemetery today. It's now the Veterans Cemetery. Um, it's very big. And um, uh, But in my story in book six, uh, his brother also takes him to a woman who gives him a witch's heart. And bloody John Bacon comes back to restart the American Revolution from the other side. Um, so these are the kinds of stories that I write about in uh, uh, my work. So in the Pineys, I take a lot of this local history, ghost stories, folk tales, and whatnot, and kind of combine them all in one big uh, crazy fun thing. It's a comedy horror. It's kind of like Ghostbusters with drunken hillbillies. So my books, uh, uh, the premise of the series is Mother Leeds was a witch, and she opened the portals of hell and flooded the Pine Barrens with devils. But in a neighboring village of Abe's Hat, New Jersey, the villagers formed a secret hunting society to hunt down the devils and send them back to hell. And their ancestors continue the hunt to this day. So uh, using that setting, uh, each book, uh, I, I, you know, I get into another, another one of these crazy stories and sort of tell you what really happened. And the characters got to got to figure it out. Book 11, uh, I called it like a Da Vinci Code for South Jersey. Um, <clears throat> book 12 is about Ong's hat, um, all kinds of different stories, ghost towns, pirate stories, um, just about everything South Jersey you could possibly think of. So uh, I want to take some questions if you guys have it. So give me give me a minute to, to get a drink here. If you got any questions about the Jersey Devil, I'm pretty I'm pretty well versed. Or anything else. I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk. Uh, I'll talk about anything you want. Um, just about. 
Um, but yeah, any, anything about the Jersey Devil or, or you know, uh, my background or, or whatever, you guys, at, feel free. Um, there's tons of other stuff you can read about in uh, some of the books. I mean, this this Pirates book is just just crazy. There's a, a guy by the name of William Treem. Treem fought during the Revolutionary War, and he was a he was he was a maniac. So he was on a ship that the British rammed into, and the Patriots there were being slaughtered by the British. And he was like a lieutenant on the ship, and he was standing up there. He was kind of caught up in the uh, the the two ships. He was caught up in the rigging, and he couldn't move, and he couldn't fight, and he's screaming at the British, calling them all sorts of names for killing everybody. And the British were so impressed by his bravery, um, they decided to let him live. So they captured him, but they sent him to uh, a ship called the Jersey, and it was in New York, and it was a prison ship, and it was practically a death sentence to be sent to the Jersey because it was rife with disease and horrible things. Uh, Treem escaped the ship. He's the only guy to escape and he swam away and he went right back to fight the British. Badass. Um, okay, I got a question. Are my Jersey Devil books available in the New Jersey State Library or on Amazon? They will be uh, in the New Jersey State Library. I don't think they're quite there yet. Andrew could answer that question uh, in terms of when that would happen. I believe they're in the midst of purchasing them. Um, they are available on Amazon. Um, they have uh, both uh, Kindle Unlimited and the actual you know, physical books you can order. They're uh, $8.99 uh, physical copies, $2.99 for the ebook, and Kindle Unlimited is free. But don't worry, I still get paid because uh, what they do at Amazon is they pay you by the page. So as you're reading it, I can see you read it. Oh, I got more questions. Here we go. I am a, this is from BB. I am a Stockton alum, Stockton College down in the Pines, and know the main road through the college is named Jimmy Leeds Road. Any stories connected to the Jersey Devil to Stockton? Not specifically. Um, Stockton's pretty modern. So mostly it's just uh, something you, you college students would hear when you move to uh, South Jersey. Um, there were lots of Leeds family members uh, in the area. Jimmy Leeds, yet another name, yet another Leeds family. Um, one of my fans emailed me who was a Leeds, and she traced her lineage back to Harry Leeds, who was, he was in some sort of popular jug band back in the 40s. But then she went further back and traced her lineage to a woman whose last name was like Elwell, there's a bunch of key names in South Jersey, Elwell, Suey, um, Leeds, and a bunch of the Collins, a bunch of other names that are very old in South Jersey. Anyhow, she traced her lineage back to Elwell, this woman who in 1692 was arrested for witchcraft and then sent me the link to her arrest warrant. And uh, I said, well, what happened? To it was really cool. Like you could read the old timey uh, uh, English language on the arrest warrant. And I said, what happened to her? And, he, and she said, well, they had a, tr they did never had the trial. They made witchcraft trials illegal after they arrested her and then they just cut her loose. So they never tried her. Um, CH asks, are you having any local Trenton area book signings? Ooh, that's a good question. Do I have any Trenton ones? Uh, let's see. I'll be in Ambler, PA on the 12th for Ambler Con. I'll be at Lower Township, Cape May on Monday uh, at the library there for an event. Uh, if you go to my website, all my appearances are there. I can't think of a Trenton one uh, in, the, in the future immediately. A lot of them are in South, further south. Oh boy. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to go through my list and I don't, my calendar. I, I've got all sorts of abbreviations, but I do about, uh, I try to do a, a, about eight events a month, <clears throat> mostly on the weekends at libraries, breweries, distilleries, um, comic book shows, uh, wineries, uh, cafes, uh, this Zoom call. So I'm constantly doing, uh, signings and I, and I tell the stories if I, if I have time and there's, 
there's an interest and answer people's questions. Um, but uh, I was at White's Bog this year. That, that was a great show, the Blueberry Festival there. I go to Clement's Farm every year. They have a Blueberry Festival. I love the Blueberry Festival. Mood's Farm. Mood's Farm's one of the best ones, too. They have a Blueberry Donuts. Oh, my God, they're fantastic. And uh, Blueberry Cider. I think they're the only people I know that make Blueberry Cider. Mm, it's fantastic. Um, uh, I did do a signing at Classic Books last year. So I have to give them a shout, see if I can get back up to Trenton and uh, uh, see if we can get a signing going again. But I'll be doing, uh, yeah, pretty much every other weekend. My uh, last really big signing I did uh, up in LBI in Beach Haven. Man, that was crazy, crazy signing. Tons of people there. Uh, great weather, too. I, I do a lot of signings outside, which usually isn't like a book guy thing because being outside with your books is a little risky. Uh, it gets, it can get rainy and windy and whatnot. Your books go all over the place. Um, but it's a very outdoor dory thing being a, being a piney or author. So, uh, I also do lines in the pines, uh, which will be in March every year. And that is like piney con every piney author comes back, uh, comes out for that. Oh, okay. Let's see. All right, I, I got some more. Uh, is there any buried treasure off the Jersey coast? Is there? Holy cow. There's so much Jersey. There's so much pirate treasure. Okay, so you got um, Blackbeard had a hideout on um, Petty Island in Pensacola, right? So he may have buried treasure there, but the rumor is he's buried it in Cape May, Burlington, a bunch of other places. Uh, Steed Bonnet, who was one of his associates, would sometimes uh, hang out with uh, Blackbeard, so possibly the same places. They would go across the river to Philadelphia and party because they had lots of money and they needed some place to uh, spend their treasure, right? So they go over to uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, the rumor is that Blackbeard buried some of his treasure on Wood Street, underneath a black walnut oak. And the story goes that a crazy Spaniard volunteered to guard the treasure in death and shot himself on the spot and was buried with the treasure. And then just for good measure, the pirates didn't want him to be lonely. So they shot his dog and threw him in the hole too. And up until 1875, there was a massive walnut oak, a black walnut oak on Wood Street. Um, and there's a quote from Ben Franklin, and I'm paraphrasing, that so many people are looking for buried treasure in uh, Philadelphia to the ruin of their own families. So this was a legit thing. I mean, people were looking for pirate treasure. Um, so you, you, you cannot imagine how much uh, uh, treasure there is in South Jersey. And... Um, there's also rumors that Captain Kidd, of course, buried his treasure uh, in uh, South Jersey, the same sort of place as Burlington, Cape May. But there's another story that said he had a girlfriend in, they say, Oyster Creek, New Jersey. I think they mean Leeds Point, New Jersey, birthplace of the Jersey Devil. And um, But this was prior to the Jersey Devil. And uh, he was married, but his girlfriend, Amanda, he said, oh, don't worry, I'm, I got to go back to England, but I'll be back. I want you to guard this treasure. So he, of course, went to England and they hung him, so he never came back. So they say Amanda may have buried the treasure or moved it. Maybe she ran off with it, or maybe she died before she could go back and get it. So there's rumors that somewhere in Leeds Point, there's a bunch of Captain Kidd's treasure. They actually found some of Captain Kidd's treasure in Long Island, New York. And then there's another rumor that some of his treasure was on an island in the Masquewan River. And that island they nicknamed Treasure Island because somebody found some Spanish doubloons there and then people went nuts and started digging the place up. The island disappeared either because it eroded away or so many people were digging there that it's, it's gone and it has been gone for many years. 
but they say there's still treasure there. Nobody ever found it. The one that I know is definitely there is at the bottom of the Delaware Bay. The most successful pirate in history was probably Black Bart. Black Bart went on a tear unlike anybody else in the history of piracy. Uh, he was just really good at it and just absolutely ruthless. At one point, he had multiple ships. So he got cornered in Cape May by the British Navy and have had to fight his way out. But he had just taken about a dozen ships. Both his pirate ships were overloaded with treasure during the fight. And one of them sank. And uh, it sank into the Delaware Bay and Black Bart got away on the other ship. So sitting at the Delaware Bay is probably... I don't know, millions and millions of dollars with a gold and pirate treasure and a bunch of cool artifacts. Um, but no one's uh, that I know of has found it yet. Um, there's also a rumors that bloody John Bacon had a treasure that was never found. Um, of course, you've got Fenton and Fagan's treasure. That's another rumor. And um, oh, there's John Batiste. So John Batiste, he was... They say he was a pirate. There's no proof he was a pirate. And this is a little later. This is the early 1800s. He, um, and this is actually in the Pirates book. He uh, was on a ship where the crew mut mutinied. And um, they ended up coming back. And before they caught the crew for mutiny, a lot of them got away and spread themselves out all over the place. Batiste went to Cape May and paid for a bunch of uh, land, like uh, nobody knows where he got the money. He paid for all this land and married a woman and started to settle down. Well, the authorities finally came to him to investigate the mutiny and uh, they didn't arrest him. So the rumor is he bribed his way uh, free of this, that he was part of the mutiny. That's why he had all this money and uh, then he retired with his pirate treasure and uh, nobody was the wiser because he just bribed his way out of it. Um, that is the history of a lot of stuff on the coastal cities of South Jersey. So, so the older cities, uh, the older towns, I'll say, they were actually probably settlements from the Lenny Lenape days and then the pirates came in and took them over, some of them. And then later the pirates would sell out to the locals or just die or whatever, and then a town would grow up there. And so you can thank the pirates for some of the Jersey Shore, <laughs> which is funny considering how corrupt Atlantic City is. So um, I'm not sure if Atlantic City was found. No, Atlantic City wasn't founded that way. It might have been. It might have started that way as a village, but who knows? Um, I write about that a little bit. I touch upon it in book five of the Pineys, uh, where I have a fictitious city named Ocean Haven, and that it's one of those cities. It was, it it, it was a uh, Lenny Lenape, then pirates, then the guys in the 1800s bought it, and then it became a shore town and a and a resort place. Oh, I'm getting so many compliments. Thanks. Thanks very much for all your fine uh, compliments. Um, sorry if I'm not seeing all, I think I'm seeing all the, all the, uh, um, uh, uh, questions and whatnot. Um, but yeah, there's just so much material here, uh, in South Jersey, just in South Jersey. Now there's stuff in North Jersey too. I mean, if you read weird New Jersey magazine, a lot of stuff they cover is mostly North Jersey, stuff like um, uh, Shades of Death Road, um, the Devil's Tower, the Devil's Tree, uh, the Gates of Hell. Uh, it's great stuff. But South Jersey has probably just as much, if not more. Uh, it's hard to, hard to t say what is uh, folk tales and what is just something somebody made up a few years ago and it just caught on. Um, but the weird New Jersey guys has a, have a lot of great information too. Um, you've got um, the Echo Ghost, which has been covered pretty much extensively. Oh, uh, we got a comment. CI says, FYI, AmblerCon says it's postponed until further notice. 
oh geez i better i better check in with them i had no idea they they've postponed <laughs> thank you for that i guess i better check in um but uh yeah so uh, the echo ghost the story goes there was a little boy who got a ball for christmas and it rolled down into the road and he went to chase it and got hit by a car and killed and now his ghost uh haunts burnt mill road in echo and i i've met a few people over the years who live in that area and they said they would sometimes scare people uh using the echo ghost story um because the story goes if you go there and you park your car and flash the headlights a certain amount of times and walk around the car and face a certain way the echo ghost appears so they wait until they see a car at night flashing their headlights and trying to trying to summon the ghosts and then they they show up and scare people so uh, it's kind of fun um these are the kinds of uh, urban legends that you know spiral out of control because it's interesting because another guy one time told me the echo ghost story but he told it in a completely different way he said it was colonial times i said it's exactly like the the echo ghost story but you were telling me it as if it happened in colonial times without a car that the little girl was run over by a horse or something he's like no no i heard it that way and uh, so this is how these folk tales uh shift and change according to who tells them and in fact when i did the jersey devil comic book um i was publishing it and then promoting it for years and years and years and then sometimes i would get my own comic book events parroted back to me by people who had said oh i heard the jersey devil was like this and i would go wait a minute that sounds just like the events of my comic book uh so it's interesting how that how you know folk tales and whatnot permeate um so you know that's that's the way it rolls that's the way it rolls geez i gotta check in with the ambler comic on comic con guys unbelievable can't believe they wouldn't send me an email um, so, so I guess I'm going to be free this Saturday. So if you need me to appear at your place, <laughs> if you've got a place that I could talk about my books and the Jersey devil, uh, shoot me an email and we'll, we'll arrange something. Um, but, um, I will definitely be at, uh, lower township in Cape May. So that one, that one's on Monday, a rare Monday appearance for me. Um, anyhow, I think, um, let's see, what are we doing on a time? Oh, coming up on one o'clock. So uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I think we, I think we may be wrapping up here shortly. Uh, I want to thank you all for, uh, attending my talk and, uh, uh, yes, this will be, has been recorded and it should be online at some point in the future. I'm sure Andrew's going to handle it. Uh, JM says, this was great. Thanks so much. And Joan of Arc is adorable. Oh, thank you. Look, Joan, you got a compliment. Joan, poke, poke your head up. Yes, you're such a cute dog. Yes, you are. Uh, check me out uh, on uh, all my various links as well. You can find me on social media. I do videos on YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute, and Rumble if you want the spicier stuff. And uh, I really appreciate you guys coming in today. Thanks to Andrew and the state of New Jersey library. They didn't even know it was a thing up until a few years ago. Uh, we have a state library. It's cool. It's cool. We have a lot of libraries in the state. That's why everybody's so smart and good looking. Um, <laughs> cute doggy assistant. Yeah, well, she's not really much of an assistant, are you, Joan? You just sit there like a lump, like a cute lump. Um, but thank you all. And thank you, Andrew. And uh, good night, everybody. We'll see you in the pines. Thank you so much, Tony. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and I, I will be posting uh, in a follow-up email a link to the recording as well as Tony's contact information. So if you want to get in touch with him for anything, or if you're interested about some of the works that he's done, you'll have that, that information as well. So yes, and thank you again, Tony. It was a fantastic talk. And while history is not on our side in terms of the Jersey Devil, we like keeping the folklore alive, and it's something that truly makes us unique um, as, as a state. So thank you for, for continuing to perpetuate the greatness of New Jersey in its folklore. Thank you, Andrew.